Hi, everybody. Thanks so much for joining us for this latest RootWorks webinar, Tips and Trip Tricks for Documenting Cannabis Compliance. Uh, my name is Ben Hartman. I'm the content manager here at RootWorks. And I'll be your host for the webinar today. Um, so if you work in cannabis, chances are you are probably aware of how complicated cannabis compliance can be, uh, how tricky and confusing and hard to keep up with uh, that it can be sometimes. Um, and the thing is, to make matters a little more complicated, even when you get everything right and do all your hit all those guidelines and all of your training uh, if you don't keep good records it can still uh come back to hurt you it can be in vain to some extent so in this uh, webinar we're going to look at what record keeping uh means for cannabis in terms of compliance and just in general and uh to help make sense of it all and why it's so important we've got an expert here and let's go ahead and introduce him to you we've got matt Rigushi. hi matt uh um, hello Matt is the Technical Director of CSQ Cannabis Safety and Quality uh, as the first cannabis certification program to meet uh, GFSI benchmarking requirements. Uh, Rigushi also co-founded uh, Azul, an online compliance supply chain data management company, worked as the Chief Relationship Officer at RisePoint and the De Director of Growth and Public Relations at ASI, one of the largest safety providers in North America. And also, last but certainly not least, he's a co-host of the brilliantly named podcast, uh, Don't Eat Poop. Uh, which covers all things food safety. Um, we're going to try to find a way to say that again here uh, <laughs> in this meeting. Um, so thanks so much, Matt. I appreciate you being here today. Thank you. Definitely. So I thought you could just start, I guess, just describe, like, what do we mean when we say record keeping in cannabis? It's not um, a matter of, you know, sending everything to your accountant or your attorney. It's um, that's not what it is. So what, what does it entail? Yeah. So, um, Great question. So for the purposes of this conversation, the record keepings that we're going to be talking about are going to be quality and safety, um, those type of things, maintenance records, et cetera. The types of things that when you go to get your license, a lot of times, depending upon what state you're in, but the majority of them are like this, they ask you to create some sort of um, cannabis safety program. And that program encompasses multiple things, you know, OSHA, it, um, uh, it, it covers, you know, making sure that you're compliant with um, the testing requirements, but also that you have standard operating procedures uh, for actual safety. You know, people washing their hands, making sure that there's no cross contamination, um, you know, making sure there's adequate amount of bathrooms, making sure that your equipment is maintained, et cetera, et cetera. So you have this binder. But what we've seen performing hundreds of audits in the cannabis industry, but thousands and thousands in the food industry as well, is that while those SOPs are beautiful, most of the time they end up on the shelf. And then when an auditor or somebody comes in, it's just, you know, dust flies off of those binders. So those SOPs actually need to be working documents, not just pretty little binders on the shelf. Mm -hmm. So it's not a matter, isn't it also just, if I get it right, it's not a matter of just making sure you have the right processes and even do those processes, but also show that you actually have records that you've done them and that you go over them and they don't have like literal dust on them if somebody comes by. <laughs> yes, yes, exactly. So um, part of those standard operating procedures are risk assessments that um, uh, many companies have done on their facilities. You know, we need to sanitize this equipment X amount of times per week or X amount of times per day, depending upon the lot. Um, you know, you're, you have your calibration of your scales, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Well, all of those things within your standard operating procedures, your SOPs, should have logging data that shows that you're actually doing it. So active, actively participating in, in, in what it is that you say you're doing to actually show that you are doing it. And so those logs could be a myriad of different forms. You know, they could be paper, they could be, uh, you know, actual paper that you go in, you fill out an Excel spreadsheet. It could be an Excel spreadsheet, you know. Um, it could be, you know, there's a lot of companies out there that are providing software for that type of thing. I think Rootworks is one of them where you can have, you know, cheap tablets at each of these different sta stations and filling out logs in, in an actual digital format. It could be a lot of different ways, but it needs to be done. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's definitely, it's one of the central um, like features that our platform, the learning experience platform has, which is to, you know, not just to make sure that you do all those things right, but that you're able to prove that you did them and then also access it. Because I guess, um, I mean, paper is great, but not everybody operates like that. And I mean, if you've got an office or facility that's just packed with all types of stuff, I mean, it's got 
making it easily accessible is also, I would imagine, a very important thing for people. Yeah, so paper in terms of, if, if we're looking at the different stages of, of training, of compliance on the actual facility floor, right? So somebody created them. So there's either the operations manager did it or some sort of secretary did it, or you actually have a food safety or quality person that did it. Somebody created those documents. Um, but then that next step is training the team on the floor, creating the culture of filling out those logs. If we look at like an evolutionary curve of getting people to do things, you want to start with the easiest process first, right? So paper tends to be the easiest process because you could just put it onto a clipboard and stick it on a nail um, right where that station is. So calibration, it could be right there on the wall where the, um, the where the scale is, and then it's documented. Sanitization could be um, like if you're sanitizing any dishes after making gummies or whatever, could be at that wash station and you're, you're, you're filling that out. You're also putting in the amount of chemicals that were used, you know, um, to the parts part per water as well. And so you're measuring that out, all this stuff. Um, MSDs could be there as well. So you, you could have everything in paper and then it gets filled out. And then at the end of the day, whoever's or week or month, depending upon how often that log is utilized, somebody can compile it. From there, then the evolutionary curve could end up with some sort of tablet. So once the, once the culture has been created that that task is being done on a regular basis, then from there, it could probably move to something where there's multiple steps to doing it. Like, for instance, if it's a tablet or, or your phone or whatever, opening up that app, filling out that document, signing off on it and sending it through. That's a little slower than paper. But the nice thing is having that data in real time. So whether or not you do it paper or you do it electronically at the source, you ultimately need that data in one place in order to aggregate it and make decisions based upon that data. Corrective actions need to be done. Uh, uh, someone needs to be retrained. Equipment needs to be um, uh, maintained. Something like that. You can you can then start doing actions based upon the tasks that were figured out based upon your logs. Mm -hmm. And in terms of um, the actual processes themselves, like which ones need to be recorded in cannabis? Is it pretty much just across the board? I guess how does somebody know? you know, what they need to record, or is it just kind of like everything? Like, how do they, how do you know? Well, that's a fantastic question. If you're, um, when you, when you go and you get your license and you're, you're creating your SOPs, um, there are a lot of different places you can go to find out what, a uh, find out what a GMP, good manufacturing practices or good agricultural practices, GAPs for your facility can be. Um, one of them is a free resource. You can just go to csqcertification.com and you can actually get all the templates for a checklist um, that will tell you what it is that you need SOPs for, risk assessments for, and what it is that you need logs for. And so then that will, will at least provide you a list of, okay, I need a log for this and, and I can put it at that station. I need a log for this and put it at that station, et cetera. Again, that's, that's for free. You can just download it and use it. And you... Um, also, if you need SOPs, there are different places and, and logs that are, you can go buy those. My company is, has one of those as well. You can purchase those uh, documents. But at the end of the day, whether you purchase them or you make them internally, um, the, the real thing that matters is that you're following through and, and performing those logs. And then if you find something wrong, performing the corrective actions, et cetera, et cetera. Mm -hmm. Do you find it's it's there's similar parallels to to what you see in food safety in your work there, or is is, is cannabis uh, you know pretty similar? Or is it more challenging or less so? What would you say? Yeah, so cannabis is an ingredient, okay, um, and so in a lot of ways, cannabis is very very similar to food. Now, cannabis is extremely more complex in certain ways. Uh, just because it's an odd, it's an odd ingredient, right? It's um, it, it it could be turned, it could be it, the flower could be smoked directly, it could be um, vaped through uh, a pen or a cartridge, it could be um, extracted and smoked that way, it can be extracted and utilized in gummies or other baked goods. So, so if you think of it in its rawest form as an ingredient, then it's 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 no different than food. But it, but it can be used in food, like, for instance, gummies and baked goods, et cetera, et cetera. Mm -hmm. So then there's a whole element of the food aspect of it 
well as um, that active ingredient, however you've um, created it to be utilized in, in that uh, food. So yeah, very similar, just a slightly different, just because it could be used in a, in a, in a multitude of things. So it's an ingredient, but we should note um, an amazing ingredient. Um, it is, yes. It well, does a lot of stuff. <laughs> I, mean, I mean, a lot more, yeah. I mean, no do, no disrespect to, you know, corn syrup or something, but um, you could, there's a lot, you know, they write a lot more songs about, about cannabis, I feel, than, than a lot of other ingredients in food, you know. They do. They do. <laughs> and, unless there's like a myriad of songs about diets or whatever, then corn syrup may be the enemy, so. <laughs> In these angry ballads, they write about it. So, <laughs> um, I could be the quote on this: the angry ballads they use the corn syrup, <laughs> like Alanis Morissette sort of thing. Um, <laughs> yeah. So we talk about, um, and I remember when we spoke recently. You said how um, you know you go to some, you've seen some places where it's like you know it's so clean and they they nailed everything compliance wise. So yeah. we can even, maybe not literally, but uh, eat off the floor, but they don't have good records. Um, so, so what does that mean in terms of, let's say some places really hit all their uh, obligations, but they don't have records. Um, what happens during a compliance visit when somebody comes by? So they, um, they're not going to pass the audit. Right. Um, and it, it ends up becoming a, a running joke. A lot of times when, when I'm doing these audits or when my auditors are, are doing these audits uh, on the field, um, you know, they have everything, but they haven't documented it. So it's like, oh, it's another minor on this question. Why? And then the, the, the auditee is going to be like, well, because I didn't document it. Right. Um, and I was just recently in a facility, we were doing a uh, consultative audit. So it wasn't an official audit, uh, just going in and, and, and helping them figure out their gaps um, between what is expected of them and what's happening in the facility. And just like many cannabis facilities, it was absolutely beautiful. It was gorgeous. Mm -hmm. it, 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 it was, oh man, I, I wish a lot of the food facilities that I'd been in um, looked as good as that, but they didn't document anything or they did document, they documented like three things and they are very, very proud of those three things. And I was very proud of them as well. Yay. Okay. So, so you understand how to document things. How do we now put it off into the other 20 things that you need to document and, um, really spending a lot of time on just creating that culture internally of documentation, 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 because, um, cannabis, you, you probably know this in a myriad of different facilities. Um, you have some facilities that are extremely well staffed, mm -hmm. but a whole lot of them that are not. You have like four or five people doing all the different jobs. So in terms of culture of training, it's very easy, right? Because you only have to train four to five people. But the, the problem is not knowing that they have to do it. It's actually doing it because they have so many other uh, jobs. They're wearing so many different hats that that extra 30 seconds of documenting it could be overwhelming. But that extra 30 seconds of documenting something has a huge ROI over a, over a period of time in a myriad of different ways. One of them is just keeping your facility. If something wrong happens and you didn't document, it doesn't matter how beautiful your facility is. Illegally, you didn't do it. Hmm. What about what about the inverse? Let's say um, you're a facility that's not immaculate like the other one, but you do have good records. Mm -hmm. So in other words, Maybe it's maybe you missed this here or there. There were some hiccups here or there, but but you have all these records to show that okay, well here's what we've done, how we were doing things 364 days out of the year, right? Um, yep. how, how does the inverse uh, work in your advantage? That is a great question, and we see that a lot, particularly in the agricultural industry, where there are a lot of packing sheds that have been, um, you know, they're they were made during World War II, you know, and they're made out of wood and. Um, there's just a lot of things going against them in terms of just the facility that they have. Mm -hmm. um, if they're documenting everything and something goes wrong, they actually have a better chance of surviving some sort of uh, legal issue, reg regulation issue. When I say legal, I mean tort, being sued. Um, uh, regulation issue, you know, having the actual state inspectors breathing down your neck, looking to shut you down because something went wrong and you don't have any documentation to to show how you fixed it um, and, and brand issues, right? How, what are you going to say to your, um, your, your clientele, your consumers, if you, you have all these, if you have an issue and you don't show that you've done anything to fix it. So the, the facility itself 
could have issues, but if they're documenting how they're correcting it over a period of time or documenting what they're doing to mitigate some of these risks that they know because their facility isn't perfect, they're actually better off than somebody who whose facility looks like a clean room hmm. if something goes wrong. Right, right. I mean, ultimately, I mean, obviously you want the facility to be more, certainly be more clean and more put yes. together. Right. But the record keeping is important. I'm trying to think of it sort of, it's almost like a, this is a strange comparison, but like, like a character witness in, in sort of a sentencing phase. It's like, well, here's, but here's the record, you know, my, my client's record, you see how he's done all this stuff. And it's, you know, maybe these things aren't the way they are, but you can prove, you know, you can prove what you usually do and that you're, you're making those efforts, right? That it's part right. of Right. And, and here's the other thing, too, is um, every single one of the facilities I go into that has a, that looks like a clean room and doesn't have any type of record keeping, they do have records that they're supposed to keep those records. So it acts against them. Right. They have the standard operating procedures that say they're supposed to be correct, correct, collecting these documents, these these records, but they're not. So it, it's actually worse because if you if something does go wrong and you do have to go to court, that the first thing the the attorneys on the other side is going to say is, "Listen, you knew you were supposed to do these, mm -hmm. things, but you didn't do them." Right, man. It was definitely not working your favor. What no, about, it does not. I mean, <laughs> no, no, it would not would not look good. So, um, when we talk about having you know an environment of safety, a culture of safety in the workplace, um, and how important record keeping is in that, like improving safety. Um, do you explain how that works? I mean, I'm, I'm picturing in the sense of like. If you have records and you're constantly, you know, filming them out and, and kind of reinforcing what you're doing, it's a sort of repetition. Is that is that kind of the way it can help with uh, improving safety, or is it, or is it a little different than that? Yeah. So the the records are not going to prove safety. The records are going to prove that you're doing what you need to do in right. order to minimize uh, a risk of safety or increase a, a, a quality or whatever. So the, the records are going to be a proof of what you're already saying that you're doing. Um, so records aren't going to get you, records aren't going to make your food any safer. It's just going to help you in, um, help you in, in doing any corrective actions. So like a lot of times people know, employees know when something is wrong. And so they'll fix it right there, but they didn't create the record that showed what was wrong and what they did to fix it. Right. I guess what I was picturing was if the act of filling out the records is a sort of a process that, that gets the person to kind of, you know, reinforce and gets it in the mind more. Oh yeah, we had to do that. We had to do that. And it's just the act of doing it just kind of makes it always more present. These sort of tasks. Oh, 100%. Yep. Yep. 100%. And it, it kind of slows the, pro it, it does. One of the biggest arguments against creating records is I, I get all the time is it, it slows my process down, which is true. It, it, it totally is going to slow the process down, but in the process of slowing it down, you might've found something that you wouldn't have actually found. Hmm. Uh, so much of the daily shift work is, um, you know, you're just doing the same thing over and over and over and over and over again. Hmm. And that, uh, inertia, uh, can, you can end up having more issues because you just didn't see something. Whereas stopping and logging something now puts you outside of that same old, same old, same old, same old. And now you're looking at things in a different direction and now you could find more things as well. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it makes sense. Was it also sort of a, um, a thing that could potentially, obviously it would require more time, but could it in some cases actually potentially save time? Cause you know that, like, okay, this is already, you can see what's already been done and who's already done what, and you're not maybe less likely to repeat things or. Right, yes. Yeah. So the, um, yeah, we were talking about this, this last time too. So part of the ROI is just operational, right? So when you're logging things, particularly if you, well, it, it doesn't matter if you have a small staff or a large staff, um, it doesn't matter. You could have shift go over mm -hmm. and, um, another shift coming in earlier or shift coming in at the right time, but another shift is leaving. And some of the stuff that needed to be done, by the guy who, or gal who's coming in for the next shift may have already been done by the person in the previous shift. So checking those documentations means that you're not working double time because right. now I don't have to do that because they did it twice because they were able to do it twice within a shift as opposed to once. Um, so there is, there is some operational feedback from there, but also if you 
a logging things like maintenance, then you know your equipment is is being maintained properly. You're not overly maintaining equipment and you're not underly maintaining equipment. Um, same with like checking for food grade oil on the equipment or, um, you know, uh, checking for a pH in your water, making sure you're not utilizing chemically chemicals um, wrong, right? You may be testing to see if, if there's free chlorine in whatever you're doing, but the pH could be wrong. So now you're, you're using way more or way less of something that you could have been, you know, making, you're not spending as much money on that chemical. So there's a whole lot of different things where logging can help operationally, which then returns on the ROI. Right. In other words, you're not going to waste time redoing some process or reusing cleaning products that you already used or things like that. Right. The other thing, too, is when you're um, checking product at the dock, say you have a bunch of suppliers and you're checking product at the dock, um, having the documentation of, you know, checking that the quality or whatever it is you're checking at receiving um, if you're able to provide that data in some sort of aggregated form, you can also see what suppliers are better than other suppliers. Mm -hmm. um, and then also what suppliers may have better quality, but may have higher risk. So, the, so depending upon the record keeping of your suppliers will also help you in terms of what needs to be done. Maybe I need to go do a check on the supplier quarterly. Um, and my SOP says that I, I should be doing it monthly or annually, but this one I'm going to do, I'm going to check on this supplier more frequently. I'm going to check on this supplier less frequently based upon that aggregated data that provided the risk. So you can save money and time that way as well. Mm -hmm. Well, how does it work in terms of um, with recording training um, in the workplace? In other words, say like you're, you're not necessarily maybe trying to meet specific SOPs, but you want to make sure that they've been trained on, your staff has been trained on this and this and this, and to be able to show that then you did those things. What what role does it play in the, that sort of, with, with training? Yeah, so so um, record keeping and training has to be done regardless uh, in, in for a multitude of different things. In, in fact, there's a whole nother section too, or expectation of retraining as well. If, if for instance, a, a, an employee, um, isn't getting it or didn't get it the first time or second time or third time, you need to keep retraining them. Um, so the uh, training can be done live, right? And then filled out on paper. And, and on that piece of paper should explain who the person was, who the person was that did the training, what the training was on. It could be a myriad of different topics. Um, what the date of the training was, how long the training was, and then who was in attendance and then signed by everybody there. That could be like a live training or a retraining on a piece of equipment, on uh, a process, on growing, on extracting all the different stuff. It could be a large training, which could be a whole day long, 90 minutes long, or it could be five minutes long, right? One of the cool things about doing it online is that you have a record of when that employee took it. You can have little quizzes on there and see that they cognitively can remember and rehash the information. And then you have it timestamped, right? It's very difficult to lie about training that is done online. Mm -hmm. One of the hard things about doing training online is you have to pull them off the line, right? So if you have an employee that's working on the line and needs to be retrained on something because they just didn't get it, a lot of times it's easier for the operations manager just to do a training right then and there saying, no, no, no. So you're doing it like this. You really need to be doing it like this. Show them how to do it, et cetera, et cetera. Just write on a piece of paper what they did, when they did it, how they did it, and then sign it, right? So that you can't really do very well online. Um, but the bigger, more complex trainings that may take more time, um, those are great online. Mm -hmm. Oh, perfect. So I think you hit upon this this concept before. It's and it's something we write about a lot. We talk about a lot, and that's in terms of the culture of the job, um, making safety a big part of the, the culture and compliance and all those things. Um, you said better record keeping requires changing the culture of the job. I guess you could describe kind of what that what that means. I guess on the day to day. Yes. So every single facility has a culture. Every single company has a culture. Rootworks has a culture, uh, CSQ has a culture, et cetera. Everybody has a culture. When it comes to food compliance or cannabis compliance, that culture could be awesome or it could really suck. <laughs> you know, like, and that, and the, the pendulum Absolutely. could swing either way and needs any place along the way in the middle. Um, so when I talk about 
culture, you can have, again, a, a, an amazingly clean facility run by a staff of five to 10 OCD people that the, the facility is absolutely gorgeous, but the documentation culture is not there. So there is a culture of safety. There is a culture of quality and sensitization and keeping things beautiful and clean and pristine, but not documenting it. So that next step has to be then learned and practiced over a period of time in order for that culture of, of actual uh, documentation to be um, um, go from a task to this is what this is what I need to do because of and this is the reason why to ultimately it's just something I do right and that trigger on the brain of just something I do takes time and takes reinforcement and commitment over and over again not just from you because you could be the CEO of the company and really really want that to happen. And you can still mess up. And internally in your culture, say you walk down on the floor and, uh, you know, you're the manager and you forget to put um, head, you, you know, your head scarf on or your gloves on or whatever, or your beard um, uh, mask on. And then one of your employees could be the gender to say, excuse me, sir, um, you know, we really need to put this stuff on in order to go into the facility. That's what I mean by culture is when. Um, the the lowest of the totem pole on ter in terms of the hierarchy of the facility is able to tell the highest person what they need to do in order to keep that um, facility safe and know that they're not going to have any um, issues in doing that. You're not going to get fired for, for saying You're not going to get fired for telling the CEO he needs to go do something, right? Or she needs to go do something no, um, if, if it's part of the SOPs, right? And so that's, that's where you go from um, this is what we're supposed to do to it is so ingrained. Everybody knows that this is what needs to be done. Right. Definitely. And I guess it's to where it becomes something that's just sort of, you know, just integrated into the daily, the daily operations and, and everybody, every employee takes part, right? It's not a, it's not a, um, it's, it's, it's a, um, what's the word? It's not a something to where only a manager can mention something and bring something up. You want everybody to be able to kind of, to be enlisted. Yeah. In this, yeah. yeah, and actually, um, a book that has nothing to do with food safety uh, or cannabis safety, but is is absolutely a great book to just think about in terms of habit and culture is actually is a book called The Habit. Hmm. It's a business book. It's a great book. Um, you you should read it and and um, incorporate some of the 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 practices in that book. It'll really help understand how to create habits like record keeping within your facility. Nice. And I imagine there's also something in there about losing bad habits. That I should say. <laughs> yes. Both. A little harder, you know? Yes. Yeah. Yes. So what do you, what would you say are the, um, if a company's looking to implement better record keeping, like, okay, they, they get it. They know it's important. They haven't done it right. Uh, but they want to, what would you say? What are your, your top tips? Like, what do you think of the, Top things you would recommend? So top things I would recommend is first having alignment over um, uh, on the top staff. So the leaders within the organization at the top have to agree that this is going to be what it is that we're going to do culturally within our facility. Once you have alignment at the top, now needs to be how do we make this as simple as possible so that operationally, we can create this habit without slowing things down to a halt, right? So then what, where should we have the, the record keeping? Should we have it centralized in, in tablets or utilized on the phone? Should we have it decentralized in uh, as paper uh, at all the different stations? Where is it that we need to have record keeping um, internally? Where do we need, we, we need to have record keeping from our suppliers? Where are we going to uh, incorporate third party to help us with record keeping? Think like rodent control, you know, traps or whatever, or whoever provides your chemicals could provide you record keeping. Um, and so then, then really hash out what it is that we need internally um, and then start dividing the tasks and then tracking the tasks. So once now you know what, uh, that yes, we all agree we need to do it. This is all the places where we need to track. Then it's how are we going to do it as a team, strategize what that looks like. And then also how are we going to keep each other? Because if you if you stop at that, at, at just, okay, this is how we're going to do it. But then you don't, 
don't continue on with the accountability, um, it's still not going to get done. It, or it may get done periodically. Um, oh, there was an issue, let's fill this log out, as opposed to an ongoing type of a cultural change. Mm-hmm. And you want to encourage employees, obviously, I imagine, to, to take part and to feel free to be like to point things out and to know that it's all like all hands on deck kind of thing. 100 percent. And the employees should be keeping everybody accountable as well. So all all the way down the hierarchy, um, it, it needs to be that, um, again, like I was saying earlier, um, the guy who is you know, just, just, he's, he's in the cultivation room or the guy who's cleaning the dishes, um, sanitizing the dishes. Everybody should have the ability to create accountability on anybody else. Awesome. I agree with that. Definitely. Well, um, Matt, before we we get out of here, um, people who are listening, people watching want to see, um, more of what you all do at CSQ, um, where should they check out just there on the website and yeah, check it out on the website or or email is me as well um, if you have any questions. But yeah, so my email would be just um, mrigushi at csqcertification.com. But yeah, check out the website. There's a ton of free resources there uh, and you can download anything or connect with me on LinkedIn or my email. And we definitely want to send people to, to Don't Eat Poop. Uh, I knew we, <laughs> yes. we had to come back to it. Uh, I know we, we say it again, but but in all seriousness, in all seriousness, um, it's it seems like a great podcast. Where, where can people check it out? Where where should they? So check? anything where you guys uh, listen to podcasts, so Apple Podcasts or Spotify, Spotify or Google or uh, Transistor or whatever, wherever you're looking for podcasts, we're we're there. And in fact, uh, um, we just had a podcast release today that was more about. Um, food related within the household. So we do a lot of stuff on household food safety and also supply chain food safety, as well as cannabis safety. Um, Last week's episode, we talked about the FDA splitting up. um, What does that look like for cannabis? How cannabis can be involved? How cannabis um, and food safety is regulated by the FDA, USDA, state departments, et cetera, et cetera. So we kind of give an explanation of that, which is very helpful for people to understand how that world actually works beyond your facility yeah. D- decoding it for a wider audience that's awesome <laughs> yes um so definitely that's that's don't eat poop uh, just like it's still just like it sounds uh <laughs> so look it up everybody and um if you'd like to hear more about rootworks and what we do um obviously you can check out our blog where we cover a ton of things in cannabis we also had a really good interview there with matt you can check out um and then also you can see our solution for cannabis, the Rootworks Learning Experience Platform, which includes record keeping as a uh, real central component of it. It, it helps um, companies of all sizes um, keep records of compliance and training and have them also to where they can access them very easily when they need them. Um, so they're never caught, uh, caught lacking what they need. Um, it's also, we also do a, a great deal in terms of training um, in the flow of work training to where it's just integrated with daily operations uh, and becomes like Matt was talking part of the culture of your workplace and uh, a big part of that is creating a culture of uh, of safety and compliance so definitely check out um, rootworks.com check out um, our platform schedule a demo and the blog and um, we'll catch you in the next webinar so Matt thanks so much for being here today thank you Ben it was fun yeah, definitely same here bye guys bye